Hi hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Matt, and welcome to the museum. Um, I'm from Taos, New Mexico, and for the past month, I've been listening to stories from locals and visitors alike, um, sharing uh, inspiring things that have been inspired by this. Um, so if you have a chance to visit, I invite you to read the different stories on the wall um, uh, and maybe share your own later. Um, so I wanted to share a couple of things with you tonight. Uh, first, a little bit of background about me and this project, um, why this project and this sport, and some of the findings while I've been here, and then maybe the future of the project and how we can evolve it. Um, so I'm an artist, a curator, architect, and urban designer from Taos, New Mexico. I'm pretty interdisciplinarian. Um, I like to play with all different types of media, and I really enjoy doing community engagement projects. Um, but since I am the architect and the designer, I do have that structural kind of thinking, and so I, I love exploring systems and patterns, things that structure our daily lives, the structures, both with water um, as well as with food. Um, and then I like to utilize community engagement as a way to help educate, illuminate, and explore these complex systems in our environment. So it's a fun and engaging way of like better understanding this thing around us. Um, and my practice includes visual arts and sculpture, as well as curation and community engagement. Um, I started the annual festival in my town, in Taos, called Museo, and it, it brings the community all together, bring designers and artists and um, thinkers and we put up temporary uh, interventions in public arts and do different engagements for a weekend. And it's really fun, a lot of new media, projection, technologies, and it's free and it's participatory. It's just, it's a really fun experience. And really begin to rethink how we can jump on these um, That's spun off into other projects, um, looking at the urban fabric and the community that we used to live in. So I'm really interested in kind of making physical um, and really making them more just and more understood and um, letting people really thrive. Um, so let's contextualize this event for Eastport. Um, so as you know, or as you should know, Eastport is just as a green port in over 20 canneries, up to 20 canneries, I guess. Um, and they not only made the cans, but they also did the packing um, sardines. And so, um, uh, I've heard from many, multi, many families of the multi generational kind of impacts and stories that their grandparents had and their parents had in uh, working with these families. Um, so, when I was applying for this residency and reading about this, this history, which is quite unique, especially for me coming from the Southwest, I actually grew up in the Midwest, so even the whole coastal um, uh, industries were kind of new to me. Um, but I could understand that the legacy of this place was instilled in the cannery industry, and that the identity of this place was really tied to, to the cans. Um, and it was really tied to this larger industrialized food system that is prevalent throughout the country. Um, so there was this collective memory that, that was shared and continued to be shared and handed down in this community. I heard a lot of those stories from this area. And so my proposal with Tides for this month. Um, was inspired by this history, but I wanted to take it a step further and expand its boundaries even wider. And so while the cane industry may have started on the East Coast, it spread across the continent and had a much greater impact. And I wanted to explore that identity then with who we are as a country, who the people who live here. And I wanted to share that through personal stories, reflections, histories, and memories. And really that fine grain element. Um, there's one way of looking at our economic engineered scale, but I think it's super interesting to start looking at actually what is, what is the impact. Um, and I've been thinking of this almost as an empathy in infrastructure and how we can look at things on a, on a deeper, deeper level. Um, so here we are, the Museum of Canned Food, first of its kind, the first one uh, pop up this month. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, really illuminating and interesting in how it, um, how it proceeds and uh, how people engage. So basically, I'm collecting America's food culture through stories preserved in the tin can. Um, uh, and what I really learned, and if you start to read some of the stories, you'll see is like just by asking the simple question about the can, um, pretty benign, pretty, you know, it, you could find a tin can, but can't food on any shelf in any store in all parts of the world. 
Um, but it had this ability to reveal our collective desire for sustenance, security, and identity. Um, and so when I see people kind of walk by, they kind of have to, like, is that a joke? Is, you know, is this thing for real? Um, and I kind of wanted it to be celebrated in that way. So it's a grand museum, placing the can up on a high shelf. Um, but it's literally been an eye opening journey. Um, and it's really been revealing some very serious experiences. Um, and um, so I really treat this as a cultural object. I really do think it holds a lot. I mean, I think it's been un underutilized or underexplored. And I think that this is a fun opportunity to sort of see what could come out of it. Um, so for more than 200 years, the metal can has impacted us economically, environmentally, informing our health and nutrition. It's fueled travel and conquest, replacing, reinforming our culture and traditions and revealing a sense of safety and security or disparity. And we'll see that kind of different juxtapositions on the wall. And so I wanted to create the space for personal reflections. And so as you read them, you'll see that some are heartwarming, some are a little bit more heartbreaking. Um, many times you might share the story, um, but they're always really authentic. Um, I think spam probably gets the most comments, uh, but actually I was just like, Chef Boyer needs the most personal reflections. Um, and, and we're, I'm going to dive into a couple of stories um, tonight and kind of share with you some of the reflections that I heard. Um, so when I started this, I thought, well, let me reach out to my immediate community and did a post on social media. Um, and I, like I mentioned, it really opened up some new lines of communication that I had. I've like, known some friends for over 10, 20 years, and the stories that came back were just things I'd never heard about them. They never thought to reveal them or, or talk about them. Um, and so it was such an interesting thing that something so random as a can could bypass sort of these um, shame or um, things that you didn't think were important and then reveal them. So it, it kind of like becomes this truth telling in cultural, social, and economic realities that instead of being judged, are positioned as an artifact of importance. Um, a valued cultural object. And it's a perspective worth protecting. Um, so this is a part of who we are. Um, and so um, I love all the different feedback. Um, and I think we're going to jump into some stories. Um, I tried to figure out if there were some shared themes going on here. And so um, this is just the beginning. Um, I've only collected around 20 story so it's, it is just starting and there is a website for everyone on zoom who wants to check it out um uh, can uh, canfoodmuseum.com and then also on instagram you can follow and i'm trying to keep those up to the posts and there's ways for you to submit your story online too um but i thought we wanted to share some of those stories um and you can see how some of these ideas are starting to come together and then for some, for those who've already read some, which is there with me, but um, some of these are really fun, so I'm going to pick out a couple. Um, so one I'm going to start with is Elias. Uh, I thought a lot of these stories, like I mentioned, for Eastport was about identity, identifying itself as a living in town where sardines come from, uh, the canning industry. And I thought this identity was interesting with Elias. Um, so his canned food immediately, he said, was USDA uh, peanut butter which is that large, funny, huge kind of can on the wall. Um, so when people send me their stories, um, I either interview them or um, help them sort of pull out more information, edit it down um, for clarity. And then I, my job is to go find the can. And I actually found, you can find a lot on eBay, and I found uh, several of these cans for the labels um, to buy. And I try, I try to match the story with um, the can. Um, so here's a license. <clears throat> so this is in Sonoma County, California, early 1970s. For my canned food memory, my mind locked onto this image of government surplus food. Mine was a bittersweet memory for when I was between the ages of six and 10 of my mom coming home and I would be playing. I would see the old mobile pull into the driveway and she would begin unloading the groceries. From the back seat, she would pull out this cardboard box. Printed on the outside of it was something like USRDA, which is United States Recommended Daily Allowances. Every month, they would pack it with different food for families on welfare. When I saw that box, mostly what I felt was excitement. I didn't know what was coming. It felt like a little bit like Christmas. It was the time of the month when the welfare system, when we weren't scrimping uh, and 
food fell from bundles. My mom would bring the box in, and I remember my brother, and I would wait for her to open it. Inside the box would be a number of things that were canned, but in particular, it was a pretty, and it was pretty consistent, was a six pound can of peanut butter. The can was so generic, there was no extra money spent on the label. It was just a can with printed on it. We didn't get to just cut loose on it when I showed up. It was part of our day-to-day -day sustenance. And I remember that the can of peanut butter never actually ended up in the cupboard. It just stayed on the counter. We could use it to make sandwiches for lunch. I remember making a peanut butter and corn syrup sandwich. We would use corn syrup like jelly. Imagine the most unwholesome white bread with a glob of corn syrup poured directly on it and spread it over peanut butter to make the most ridiculous sandwich. This would be part of each day until we ran out of it. There was so much, there was so much peanut butter. Six pounds is a lot, even for three growing kids. We weren't supposed to eat it outside of meals, but here's the thing. This, this is one of the fondest memories of the experience. No one would know if in the middle of the day I popped off the lid and took a big scoop of peanut butter out and went to the backyard and made fireworks. But as the years rolled on, there was a point where I thought, oh, we're getting help. And I'd ask myself, who are these people who need help? So at about 10, I started to see the box a little bit differently. There was still this part of me that loved the can of peanut butter, but there was another part that I wanted to disassociate from it. I didn't want the other people to know we were getting government food. I didn't want to feel judged or feel any barriers. So in my childhood, we moved around the Sonoma County. We lived in six different houses. For this memory, our home was in a neighborhood of other families that were in the same economic status. But when we moved, we relocated to a nicer neighborhood, and then I became more aware of things like the plane and the peanut butter. By about age 12, I was trying to figure out how to put the peanut butter can in the cabinet when my friends were playing. I have this warm and cozy memory around this relationship with peanut butter. To this day, I've never had a sip of it. In retrospect, it may have been the most wholesome food I ate as a child. Mm -hmm. So I like how he, he brings in this element of identity. Um, and it's really one that I think I'm going to keep exploring. And of course, it speaks economics, which I think a lot of these stories were good, but also with just a little bit of judgment or shame um, being caught in sort of a system. Uh, interesting, I had a people have commented on that can too. And I had someone mention to me, and I didn't think about this, that they actually changed the food stamps shortly after so that it didn't have this I'm sure there's other reasons, but I thought that would be interesting. Uh, I guess you can actually get the same food that you make yourself, so to speak. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Richard's. Um, Richard's Sarah, and this is in Jericho, New York in the 1970s, and it's a Campbell's tomato soup, also a very popular canned food item that people like to talk about. Um, in this one, I'm going to read, I, I found references to economics, but also in safety and security. Um, and so I'll, it's not too long, so I'll read this one and um, you guys can see what we think. My canned food memory is one of being scolded by my mom, who hated tomato soup from the can. When I was a kid in the 70s, I don't know exactly how old, maybe when I was in junior high, one day while my mom was at work, after I got home from school, I was hungry and I went to the pantry to search through all the canned food in the shelf. I noticed the can of tomato soup that I thought my mom wouldn't miss because she never ate tomato soup. So I figured I'd have tomato soup as an after school treat. I put the tomato soup on the stove, heated it up, and I ate it. My mom walked in later in the house around four o'clock to make dinner and she said, What's that smell? I said proudly that I made a can of tomato soup. She said, Oh, it's horrible. It's a horrible smell. Don't you ever make tomato soup? Didn't you know that when I was a kid in Brooklyn during the Depression, all we did was stay in the soup kitchen lines, and tomato soup is what they serve. I hate tomato soup, and I hate the smell, and I don't you, don't you dare ever make tomato <laughs> soup again. <laughs> so my mom's family were super poor Italian immigrants. Her parents never had an education, never spoke English. My grandfather was a bricklayer, my grandmother a seamstress, and they were lucky enough to have work. It was um, when they were lucky enough to have work. It was the Depression, soup kitchens were a weekly thing. They would go uh, for a weekly meal at the, at the soup kitchens. She was young, pre war. Um, she was probably around 10 or 15 years old for her. So um, I loved hearing that story. One, I know Richard very well, and um, I never heard that story from him. And um, I just thought that was super interesting, especially coming from his mother, who had this strong memory in the hands of the king. Um, the other thing that has come up a lot is the sense of 
kids. Um, I think even for me, coming home from school and making a snack, um, the canned food kind of became that easy to, to get to um, uh, thing that you can, for your first time cooking, it was manageable. Um, so Jolene has a great story with the chef boy um, and it's cute, it's a sweet one. Um, so this takes place in Taos, Mexico, 1950s. Canned food was really big in our house. My mom grew up poor. They had a big farming garden, but it seemed that most of the fresh produce would get sold. They would buy canned food because it's cheaper, or it was that thing where people would buy it because it appeared to be fancier than what fresh thing. It was a prepared food. This memory takes place in the summer during lunchtime when I was six years old. It continues up through grade school. My sister is five years older than, than me and was old enough to take care of us. My mom was also experimenting with leaving us at home for little chunks of time. So my sister would be in charge and she would prepare lunch. We had this counter in the kitchen that we'd sit at with bar stools. There was this little TV that we'd watch while we were eating. It was one of those summer days that felt so decadent. We get to watch TV and do the things you normally don't get to do as a kid. I remember having that feeling of independence and space. And I remember that it was so fun. We had this pantry full of canned food. We felt independent because we chose what we wanted to make these things ourselves, reheating stuff like soup and leftovers. In retrospect, I now realize that my sister totally swindled me out of my food. My sister would open the can of Chef Boyardee beef ravioli and she would say, you really like the sauce and I really like the ravioli, so how about we give you extra sauce and I'll take all the ravioli. <laughs> I thought I was getting this great deal and that ended up being our setup. I remember having a bowl of sauce and being totally happy. <laughs> I don't think it ever occurred to my sister that I was crummy to do that or to ask if I was hungry. Um, she was just like, yes, I got the right <laughs> I guess she doesn't even remember. It's just one of those things you do in sports. So I really like that one. Um, canned food traditionally was uh, actually marketed to women in the middle of the 20th century as sort of the convenient way to feed your family. So like open and serve. Um, and so uh, pre-chopped veggies, fully prepared meals so that would come out of the hand. Um, and it went kind of hand in hand with this larger women's liberation movement. And so this impact on independence and living um, in a fast-paced world and working families kind of continues. So there's some books over here that I read that kind of helped contextualize these different cultural social movements that we go through. And so um, it's been, I can totally geek out on this show you guys. So, um, but it's super, I find it super interesting. And that's kind of these little baby doll or doll house cans also hints that there's a lot of marketing toys being produced for little girls. Also, this through the industry too to promote this idea of a house and a kitchen that has canned food. And so there was there's a lot of marketing and a lot of persuasion that happened throughout this whole industry too, which I find super, super interesting. And I'll end here with Leon's um, Leon's story that takes place in Brooklyn. Um, and this one I thought was super sweet, really about tradition and ritual. And I think with food, of course, you're gonna have that. Um, that theme and that um, combination. Um, so Leon's is about spam. This is right there, 1960s. It's a nice little short one. My memory takes place in downtown Brooklyn, New York, in the uh, Farragut housing projects. It was a low-income housing project consisting of 10 buildings with 13 or 14 stories in each building and 10 apartments on each story. There's a lot of people and everyone, everyone did spam at least once a week. In our house, spam could last two, three, four, or five years, a can of spam. My mother would buy in bulk at four or five cans at a time, knowing that along with sardines, it could be on the shelf forever. My memory of spam is as a midweek delicacy, especially when my father cooked. My father did not believe in using a lot of hot chip dishes. Everything was cooked in one minute. He would slice the, pan, the spam really thin. He then placed the spam, potatoes, and whatever vegetable he cooked, pulled out of a can also, into a pan and fried it up. As we were doing our homework, we could hear the crackle and the smell of the spam smoking room. Then father and mother would call us to dinner. We hit the table, and especially the boys, me and Keith, we dig in. We put ketchup, mustard, and whatever else we wanted all over it. We chow down. Um, so in exploring the history of canned food, I know there's more out there, and there's more to be heard and uncovered. Um, and I think there's additional themes from mobility to health, to environment, and exploitation, all, all those kind of things that I think are inherent within this sort of infrastructure of canned food. 
Um, but it really does embody all these themes. And by collecting these personal accounts, we can better understand our contemporary human patterns, feel how we feel in a mission, um, how we witness our struggles, triumphs, our joys, and pains. And so um, I really do think this really defines our culinary landscape in many ways. Maybe it's an unseen thing that we don't really recognize. I don't it's all farm to table and organic, which I totally get, but I think that there's there's something um, there's something missing if we if we don't recognize it's in that for the majority if we don't. So um, so yeah, I think I hope to kind of illuminate our culinary past, <laughs> recontextualize the present, maybe imagine an expanded future for the American story with food. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions or tell you more about the different projects or ideas and and um, but please take some time to read the stories. Um, if you do have a story, I love, I'm still collecting stories. I have one more day tomorrow, um, 11 to 3. Um, but then, as I said, the project lives on on the website. And on the so, um, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. <laughs>